Well, hello everyone and welcome. My name is Mike Decker. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today we are broadcasting from a neighborhood uh, sort of in the foothills of Orange County known as Shady Canyon. Uh, most of you uh, locally probably uh, know that Shady Canyon is this beautifully uh, pristine, protected uh, kind of neighborhood. In this uh, area, there's a lot of professional athletes that live up here. Certainly there's uh, many uh, successful business uh, entrepreneurs who live in, in the neighborhood. For those of you who uh, might be looking for a neighborhood to, to move into, this is a, a neighborhood that you might want to consider just two houses down, for example. I know that there's a home listed for like 8.65 million, which I'm quite sure it's, it's pretty nice. Uh, if, if you're looking for something a little bit tad bigger with a little bit bigger footprint, there's one on sale for up for sale for 19 million. And so if you're out of the neighborhood or out of the state and you're looking for a place to, to move into, this might be the place you want to look at. Listen, we're super excited to be here. Uh, I fortunately have a friend who lives here in Shady Canyon and he has invited us to do our broadcast. And so what do you say we head to the backyard and we'll pick up our conversation there. So here's the big idea that we're gonna talk about today. If you're taking notes, if you have the, have the Palm Harvest app, jot this down, and that is, in Jesus, I can live a life of freedom. In Jesus, you and I can live a life of freedom. You know, if you were to define the word freedom, how would you do that? If you were to explain you know, to someone what freedom looks like, what examples might you give? You know, back on January the 6th of 1941, United States President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he addressed Congress on the state of the war in, in Europe. And much of what President Roosevelt said that day has, has been forgotten. But at the end of his address, President Roosevelt gave what some have called his Declaration of Freedom. His Declaration of Freedom. You know, similar to Martin Luther, Luther King Jr.'s speech, his famous speech, I Have a Dream, this would, would probably be Franklin D. Roosevelt's uh, I Have a Dream speech well. And in this speech, President Roosevelt declared how he looked forward to the day when the world would experience basically four essential human freedoms. Four essential human freedoms. Do you know what they are? The freedom of speech, the freedom of worship, the freedom from care, meaning people's needs would be met, and the freedom from fear. The freedom of speech, the freedom of worship, the freedom from care, and the freedom from fear. Those were President Roosevelt's hopes. You know, when we think about the idea of freedom, neither Martin Luther King Jr. or Franklin D. Roosevelt came up with that first. You know where the idea of freedom originated, don't you? It came from our Creator, uh, creator God. Because the Bible teaches that God wants you and He wants me to live a life that is characterized by freedom. And so in Jesus, I'm just inviting you to embrace this concept that in Jesus, you and I can live a life of freedom. You know, if you have a Bible close by, I would love for you to grab it right now and, and turn in it to the book of Romans chapter 8. Once you find chapter 8, look right away at verse 1 and then uh, follow along as I read, uh, beginning in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. This is what the Bible says. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ. Now let's stop there for a second. You know, one day we're gonna stand before God, our heavenly creator, and you and I are gonna be judged for how we lived here on this earth. We've talked about that before. 
you know, God's going to look at you. He's going to look at the good and the bad, the right and the wrong that you have maybe committed or not committed uh, over the course of your life. And then consequently, he's going to dole out both punishment and reward. But you should know, and we've talked about this before, or you can know that if you have Jesus a part of your life, you know, if you've asked Jesus to forgive your sins and to, you know, kind of continue to transform you into the person that you want to be and who God has created you to be, then you and I can know, based upon what the Bible teaches, is that when we stand before God, our heavenly creator, we are not going to stand alone, but rather Jesus is going to stand there with us. You know, I mentioned earlier how in this, this Shady Canyon neighborhood, there's a lot of professional athletes who, who have homes up here. And many of these athletes, if, if they were to leave the security gates of, of this community and go to their workplace and they're out doing the job in the, to the sports arena world, most of you likely know that many of these athletes have bodyguards that accompany them to and fro. You may not always see them, but I assure you that these bodyguards are, are in the neighborhood so to speak, because when maybe you have this crazy fan suddenly jumps up and tries to, you know, get too close to this professional high-priced athlete, these bodyguards will step in to provide some security. Well, I use that as an example because when you and I stand before God and we're called to judge, the, the Bible says here in verse 1 that, that we can do so, we can face God's judgment without fear because Jesus is going to be right there with us. There's no fear of condemnation. There's no fear of judgment. Let's keep reading verse 2. So the Bible writer, the Apostle Paul says this, he says, because you belong to him, because you belong to Jesus, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Friends, when you offer your heart to Jesus, the Bible writer is telling us here that God, our Heavenly Father, places in you his life-giving spirit, a spirit that will empower you and who will help you to live differently. A couple more verses. Look at verse 3. Paul writes, the law of Moses, which we know was the Ten Commandments, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son, Jesus, in a body like the bodies that we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Do y'all remember what we talked about last week when we looked at, at chapter 7 here in, in Romans? The Bible writer in, in chapter 7, and I love chapter 7 because he, he, he really reinforces that, that this truth that sin is powerful. And, and, and sin really creates this struggle. If you, if you look at verse 18 in Romans chapter 7, I want to read them because they're, they're so great. Look at what, what Paul writes. This is one of the greatest missionaries, one of the early Christians, kind of the early grandfathers, if you will, of the early church. And listen to what he writes about his, his own personal struggle with sin. Verse 20, 18. He said, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what's right, but I can't. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. Can you relate to that? He says, but if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It's sin living in me that does it. I've discovered this principle of right, life, he says, that when I want to do what's right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, he says. I love the Ten Commandments with all my heart. But he says there's this another power at war with my mind. Pay attention to that, with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person that I am. Can you relate to that? You ever felt that way? You know, you fall down, you want to do well. Maybe you say something you wish you wouldn't have said. Maybe you act in a way that, ah, oh, it's so embarrassing. Why do I keep doing that? What a miserable person that I am. You can relate to Paul. So here's the answer, verse 25. He says, he asks, who will free me from this life that's dominated by sin and death? And he gives us the answer. He says, thank God. The answer is in Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now listen to me. 
What Paul is telling us here in chapter 7 and what he's really reinforcing here in chapter 8 is that in Jesus, I can live a life of freedom. Yes, sin is strong. I'm not discounting that truth. Yes, sin has powerful influence upon my life choices. I'm not minimizing that. But friends, what I want you to understand today is that if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you need to know, you must remember that God's Holy Spirit, His powerful Spirit is living in you. And God's Spirit is strong. And God's Spirit, the Bible writer promises, is going to help us defeat sin. In Jesus, we're told that you and I can be set free from the guilt of sin. You ever feel guilty? The Bible writer is saying that we can be set free from the guilt of sin, which then allows us to live going forward this life of freedom. So how do we practice, practically do that? How do you and I live a life of freedom? Well, I'm gonna give, let me give you a three-pronged strategy, okay? So point number one, two, and three. So write this down. Grab your Palm Harvest app if you have it. Go to your, your, your notes and write down this three-pronged strategy. Ready? Number one. What I think about matters. What I think about matters. Number two, where I look influences my direction. Where I look influences my direction. And then number three, who I lean on shapes my outcome. Who I lean on shapes my outcome. What I think about matters. Where I look determines my direction. And who I lean on determines the outcome. Now read with me a, a few more Bible verses and then I'm going to flesh these three-pronged strategy points out by telling you a motorcycle story. An experience I had just this, this week. Look at verse 5 here of Romans chapter 8. The Bible writer says this. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about the things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. Again, point number one, what I think about matters. Verse 6. Letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. If you're a Bible underliner, underline that word peace. Friends, you want to have peace in your life? You want to experience peace in the midst of turmoil? Let God, the Holy Spirit in, impact your mind. Verse 7, for the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. A couple more verses, verse 9. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. Did you hear that? You are not controlled by your sinful nature. You're controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. Verse 10. Christ, he says, lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. Now don't miss this. Verse 11. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Think about that. The whole purpose of the gospel, the whole message of the Bible is the fact that Jesus Christ was sent by God to, to come and die in my place. And once he died, the Bible, you know, we celebrate at Easter how God raised Jesus from the dead. And here we're told that that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the tomb when we trust in Jesus, that same spirit now lives in us. And the Bible writer says, as, and just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, just as, just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. Last Monday, my wife Robin and I decided to take a motorcycle ride. 
Robin, uh, we've set up this kind of the schedule where she's taking every other Monday off so that we can spend some time together. And so we decided that we would explore sort of the mountain range uh, just north of Los Angeles. And we were not alone. We had four other motorcycle riders with us and, and each one had their own, their own motorcycle. You know, there was a ride, wide range of expertise uh, among the, uh, us in the group. You know, everyone's pretty good. And so uh, as we were uh, out enjoying, uh, you know, the Crestline, uh, sort of Los Angeles mountains, we got up to the top where we wanted to go and we were hoping to grab some lunch, but because of all the snow that we've had, the rain and snow we've had, uh, we were, uh, the roads was blocked. There was snow, on, you know, on, alongside the roads and stuff. And so we were forced to, to come back, turn back and, and head for home. Well, as we were uh, headed down the kind of the mountain this time, uh, something very unfor unfortunate uh, happened. Uh, one of our riders happened to be going, who was in the lead, happened to be going into the curve just a little bit too fast. And so gravity and momentum took over. You probably know where I'm going with this. And before you know it, he was, he was in, in a bit of a trouble. And so to, for him to, in order to prevent this collision really with with the mountainside, uh, he did what most really expert riders will do in his effort to try to pull out of this inevitable uh, collision with with the ground. He basically decided to put the bike down and uh, kick it, kind of kick it away from him. Well, instinct instinctively, as a result of this uh, this decision. It, it resulted in this horrific crash, which is, which is never a good thing. Now, because of God's protective hand on his life, I don't want to minimize that. Uh, also, because of the quality sort of motorcycle gear he was wearing, he had a good helmet on, he had good leathers with protective you know, pads on, he had good, good boots, uh, in addition to the fact that the motorcycle was equipped with sort of these highway uh, bars, uh, which, um, or engine guard, I guess you could call it too. So when, you, when the bike went over, when it went onto its side, basically the bike then rides on these these metal uh, engine guards uh, instead of, of crushing crushing his his leg so all that to say uh, Rick um, when when the dust all settled and there was lots of dust he ended up ended up breaking uh, six ribs uh, probably the main left side of, of his body he had a bruised lung and an airlift helicopter ride off the mountain you know, we want to give props certainly to the courtesy of the Los Angeles Sheriff's uh, search and rescue team. They were amazing. And because of their efforts to get Rick down the mountain, Rick got to enjoy kind of a, two nights in a cushy ho hospital. <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. Every motorcycle rider knows that what you think about matters. Point number one. And that where you look influences your direction, point number two. You know, when you're on a motorcycle, there's no room for daydreaming. There's no really space for you to have a moment of mental, mental lapse or to lack of focus. Rather, your eyes have to be on the road. You're constantly looking for, for rocks and, and potholes and, you know, any kind of obstruction that could cause you to, to have any problems, wildlife, for example. You're always looking ahead and, and trying to sort of anticipate what you need to do in order to navigate the road safely. Why? Because what you think about matters and where you look influences your direction. Here's the temptation. When you're on your motorcycle and you happen to see, let's say for example, a rock in the middle of the road. You know, there was, like I mentioned, there was lots of snow uh, up where we were at along the sides of the roads. And so there was causing, as it was melting, it was causing some rocks to come out into a road. And so when you see a rock in, in the middle of the road, what do you tend to do? Well, you tend to, to fo focus on it. You tend to, you, you tend to see it. Now here's the problem with that. When a rider focuses his attention on something, that's where the bike will go. And so when in reality, in order to prevent a collision with that pothole or with that bear or with that deer or with that rock that's in the middle of the road or that black ice or the ice that you might see there, what you have to force yourself to do 
is look in the direction that you want to go because what you think about matters and where you look will determine and influence your direction because if you don't, what you focus on, you're going to hit it. You know, when you see a potential danger, the goal is not what do I not want to hit. The goal is not do I, to look at not where I want to miss, but rather the goal is where do I want to go. Important. Because when we come back here to Romans chapter 8, that's exactly what the Bible writer is telling us as, as followers of Jesus. He's saying what you think about matters. Where you look will influence the direction that you go. What you lean upon shapes your outcome. Friends, here's my point. You and I have a choice in life. And where you look will influence your direction. Are you going to give in to worry? Or are you going to focus on the peace that God offers you? Are you going to see the negative in things? Or are you going to focus on the positive? Are you going to dwell on fear and the possibilities of the what ifs? Or are you going to hold on to hope? Are you going to be held back by sin? Or are you going to live in the spirit. You know, you and I, you and I have a choice. Are we going to focus on who we want to be and who God says we are? Or are we going to listen to the devil? You know, if you have given your heart to Jesus, verse 14, if you skip down in Romans 8, reminds us that you're a child of God. In fact, write this down somewhere in the margin of your notes. Life is a combat zone. Life is a combat zone. Therefore, life is not peril free. Life is not without hazards. Friends, the Bible writer is reminding us that we are engaged in a mental battle, which is a spiritual battle. It's flesh versus spirit. Listen, right now, Rick is contemplating. I know, because we, we, we've talked, praise the Lord, he's home and then he's trying to recover now. But Rick is now contemplating whether or not he's ever going to ride a motorcycle again. It's a good, good decision to think about. Now, personally, I hope he does. Rick's a great rider. In fact, one of the reasons why he's alive, probably alive today, is the fact that he's a good rider. Because if he wasn't, he, he probably would be pushing daisies. Now think about this. How many of you, show of hands, how many of you have ever been in a car accident? Either as a driver or a passenger. How many of you have ever been involved in a traffic collision? Did that traffic collision keep you from ever getting in a car again or getting behind, the, from keeping you from getting behind the, the wheel of a car? You know, this past week here in Los Angeles, Tiger Woods was involved in a car accident and if you've, if you've read any of the reports, and I assume they're true, his injuries, injuries are far worse than Rick's. You suppose that Tiger Woods will ever get into a car again? Or do you think he's going to avoid that? Parents, have you ever taught your child how to ride a bike? Most of us have. What happens when your child falls? Inevitably, when you're learning how to ride a bike, somebody will fall. Inevitably, there's blood and there's tears and there's scraped up skin. What do you do? Well, you pull out the band-aids, you, you, know, you know, wash things off, you give them a little peroxide on it, and you give them lots of encouragement to get back on the bike and go. You ever been fired or lost a job? Has that prevented you from looking for another job? Has that prevented you from, from putting, submitting a new resume? No, it hasn't. Some of you, for example, have, have experienced a divorce in your life. You've experienced a breakdown in a, in a relationship. Friends, don't let that keep you from loving. Don't let that experience keep you from, from dating. Don't let that experience keep you from opening your heart to somebody else. Listen, personally, I hope that Rick rides again. And if he chooses to, I, I know that he will be a better motorcyclist than he was before. Because how do we gain experience? By making mistakes. Here's my point. 
I know that recovering from failure is not easy, so don't, he don't hear me say that. But what I do want you to he hear me say and what I want to remind you of is what the Bible promises in Philippians chapter 4, 13. The same guy who's writing Romans 8, he ri later writes in, in Philippians 4, 13, where he says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can tackle every challenge in my life through Christ who gives me power. Friends, the, the devil wants to hold you down. The devil wants to keep you from trying. But the Bible writer reminds us here in verse 10, and this is a good verse to underline, is that the same Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. And because of this truth, we can live our life with freedom. You know, over the last couple of weeks, we've looked at Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 7, and Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 6, we learned how in Jesus I can live a life of victory. And in Romans chapter 7 last week, we talked about how in Jesus I can live a life of liberty. And here in Romans chapter 8, it's kind of a three-chapter bookend. The Apostle Paul is writing to you and to me to say that in Jesus, I can live a life of freedom, a, freedom, a life of victory, a life of liberty, and a life of freedom. So my question to you today as I wrap, begin to wrap up this broadcast is where is God inviting you to trust Him? You know, where might God be inviting you to move forward. You know, friends, I want to encourage you to say no to worry and say yes to peace. Say, nay, say no to fear and yes to hope. Say no to the negative and yes to the positive. Say no to the flesh and yes to the spirit. What you think about matters and where you look will determine your direction. And who you lean upon will shape the outcome. So let's close this conversation by going and leaning, going to and leaning upon the one who can shape the outcome. And so I just invite you right now to say this prayer of faith with me. Let's say a prayer together. So wherever you're at, maybe if you're able to close your eyes, if you want to open the palms of your hands as if you're just saying, God, here I am, weakness and strength, pray this prayer in your heart. Just say, Heavenly Father, please help me to keep my mind on you. Please help me to keep my focus on you, not on my circumstances not on my failures, God, and not on my fears. You know, for those of you who are in the combat zone right now, right? For those of you who are, pray who are facing challenges in your life, will you pray this prayer in your heart? Will you just say, Jesus, please walk with me? Jesus, please empower me through these trials that I'm facing? Say, Jesus, I want to experience your resurrection power in my life. Now I want you to pray. Before we close, I'd like you to pray for Rick. Will you do that? You know, right now, Rick's hurting. Rick's not feeling so good. And so would you just, in your heart, would you say, God, would you please heal Rick's body? God, would you... Would you just touch him? And would you give him mental peace? And then close by saying, God, thank you for hearing my prayer. And thank you for helping me to, to know that I can live my life with confidence, knowing that in you, Jesus, I can live my life with freedom. It's in Christ's name that I pray these things. And everybody said, A, Amen. Listen, if you have a prayer request, 
If you're in the combat zone right now and you would like somebody to be aware of, of what's going on in your life, would you just take a moment, grab your Palm Harvest app. If you go to the very bottom of it, there's this little connect tab. And if you click on the connect tab and then go down like four or five, you know, spaces or emojis, if you will, you'll see these, these praying hands. Just click on that praying hands, uh, you know, button, so to speak, and it'll allow you to send a prayer request, which I will get immediately once, once you hit send. Or for those of you who might be listening to Anchor and maybe uh, us on Anchor and maybe you've got, don't have the app, if you want to send me your prayer request to prayer at palmharvest.com, prayer at palmharvest.com, same result, I'll get a prayer request from you and then I will be able to join you on your journey as you're trying to live your life with Jesus with freedom. Listen, thanks again for, for tuning in. Thank you for your support. You know, thank you for your invitations uh, like this one to come to, to your neck of the woods. You know, a few of you have reached out to us. I got to just tell you full disclosure that it's got to warm up a little bit before we venture out into North Dakota and Minnesota, but we're talking about it. And hopefully this summer we can, we can come join you in, in your neighborhood. And so if you're watching on YouTube, Please like this channel, and if you found this broadcast somewhat encouraging, maybe you want to share it with somebody who you know who could use a little pick-me-up. So that's, that's, that's all I have to say, to brothers and sisters. In Jesus, you and I can live with freedom, and so let's do that this week, shall we? I'll see you soon.